So there were no surprises, right? The quiz was as straightforward. That was as straightforward as I could make it. It's actually the first time I've actually asked a question about converting stories to numbers. So I, I think I'm gonna work on that more. I think I can get a little more creative. This time I had to go basic because I wanted to see how you guys would do. But it's pretty straightforward, right? What, what's the story that I'm gonna increase my market share of a mature market? By increasing price, by, by cutting prices. So I'm going to go for more market share. And I'm going to also go into Asia because that's where the growth is. So, first question I asked you was about revenue growth, assuming the story is right, revenue growth is going to go up, down, or do nothing. It's going to go up. You're getting a higher market share. What's going to happen to margins? They're going to go down. You're cutting prices. And if you're going to Asia, then you're increased, because I told you there were US-based company going to Asia, you're going to risk your markets, your cost of capital should go up. And what will this all do to value? God only knows, right? Because you know, you've got growth, uh, growth going up, margins going down. And I, you know, it's something that when I sent you feedback on your DCF, you were expecting detailed feedback, like your beta is off by 0.03 or deeply disappointed. You know, what I was looking for is essentially the story you were telling, the numbers that came out of your story and whether your story made, in you. and that's why some of you I noticed left the story sheet with whatever was in there, which was this Korean battery company, which really has nothing to do with your company. So if you get a chance, please go into that story page and fill in your company's story because it's good for you to actually tell your own story rather than just think in terms of numbers. So let's, uh, let's pick up where we left off. We were talking about valuing difficult to value companies and I want to start on emerging market companies. So I wanna talk a little bit about what it is that makes emerging market companies tricky. So let's say you have an emerging market company. God help you, maybe a Russian company, but it's not a Russian company, an Indonesian company, a Brazilian company. Remember those four questions. What are your cash flows from existing assets? What's the value of growth? How risky are you? When will you become a mature company? Those are questions you ask about any company, but when you ask them of an emerging market company, even if it's a nice mature, even if it's a nice mature emerging market company, here's what you're gonna see. The country is always part of your story, right? Do you, need, do you know what I mean by that? You value a Brazilian company, you could do everything right on the company, but the country can go to hell in a handbasket and take your valuation down with it. So it's almost like every part of your story, the country intrudes, which is a problem because in a sense, you want to focus on the company and with emerging market companies, it's often difficult. So what I'd like to do is focus on a few things that are not just unique to emerging market companies, but perhaps accentuated with emerging market companies. Here's the first one. Country risk is front and center, but you need a scalpel, not a bludgeon. What I mean by that is many analysts, when they value country risk, it comes in everywhere. Their risk-free rate is a government bond rate, which includes country risk. Their country risk premium is the same for every company in that country. So if you're a Nigerian company, every Nigerian company gets a country risk. So you think about what we did about assessing country risk premiums and then looking at where your exposure is, we were saying it's not fair to take every Indian company and give it the Indian country risk. You got to bring it into the process a little more carefully. So if you're adjusting your, your risk premium for exposure, you're doing it in a much more careful way than what most analysts are doing. When you take the country risk out of the government bond rate, you're making sure you're not double punishing or triple punishing this company. The second is behind the country is also the currency issue, right? And you're valuing a Brazilian company, you're constantly saying, what will happen to the RIA? Will it strengthen? Will it weaken? And the numbers are going to look very different when you value the company in US dollars and you value it in the local currency. Much higher discount rates, much higher risk free rates. And often people spend too much time trying to decide what currency should I use? If you remember when we talked about currencies, what did we say that if you are consistent about how you treat currency, it shouldn't affect your value, right? 
Now, part of you might have intellectually agreed with that, but the other part is saying, right, I switch currencies, everything's going to change. How the heck can value not change? So I'm going to give you an example, a company called Infosys. Infosys is an Indian outsourcing company. So the first column, I have a valuation of Infosys. I did entirely in Indian rupees. The same point in time, same company, same financials, I value in Indian rupees. And then I revalued the company at exactly the same time in US dollars. So let me go through the inputs and I'll give you good news and bad news as we go along. When I move from US dollars, I'm sorry, Indian rupees to US dollars, the good news is my discount rates all become lower, lower cost of capital. Why? Because the inflation effect is much smaller, lower risk free rates. That's the good news. The bad news is when I value my company in US dollars instead of rupees, my growth rates are also going to be lower. Why? Because I don't have inflation as a ballast pushing up my growth rates. So I have lower discount rates, lower growth rates. And at least at this point, when I valued Infosys on the, on the day that I valued it, the value that I got for the company on a per share basis in Indian rupees converted to the exchange rate that day was exactly the same as what I'd have got valued in dollars. It's not magic. Basically what's happening is the inflation effects offset. So when I switch from a lower inflation to a higher inflation currency, both my growth rates and my discount rates increase by exactly the same proportion. Mathematically inflation cancels out. And this is insanely good news because we are working with a currency with high inflation as some of you were, your valuation becomes, you know, numbers start to add up, zero start to pile up. It's easier to value a company in a lower inflation currency than a higher inflation one. I've just given you the up. You want to value a Nigerian company in euros, you can do it as long as you stay internally consistent. So take care of country risk, but don't let it overwhelm you. Don't worry about currencies, pick one and be consistent. Third, and this is a question I asked you at the start of the class last week about corporate governance. Again, it's not fair to pick on just emerging market companies. Let's face it, there are US companies with horrifically bad corporate governance. You read the news this morning about Elon Musk taking a 9.2% position in Twitter, right? I'm gonna give Twitter credit. I mean, I've been, I've been rough on Twitter through their entire lifetime. It's a company that can't figure out how to get their business model right. But you know that Twitter is one of the only social media companies that didn't create two classes of shares when they went public. Facebook did it, LinkedIn did it when it went public. Every other company, Snap did it. Twitter was the only one that did not have two classes of shares. They're saying now it's coming back to bite them. But in a sense, this could be good for Twitter because Jack Dorsey might not be the right person to run Twitter. In fact, he knows that he's going off to Africa, wherever he's going. You know? And if they'd had two classes of shares, it would have been impossible to create change. So corporate governance is an issue everywhere. The question is, what do we do about that in valuation? And I gave you some clues, right? If you're doing a discounted cash flow valuation, you control the process. It's your valuation, your assumptions. And if you feel, feel worried about corporate governance, the easiest way to do it is to bring it into your valuation by saying in this company, change is very difficult or impossible. So as I show you the numbers for an Indian company, think about what this will play out like for Twitter, how your assessment of value for Twitter today might be different from yesterday. It's a company called Cube Investments. It's a very old family controlled company in India. It's a public company, but it's family controlled. So this is a valuation I did way back in time. The numbers themselves are not that significant, but here's the key thing that you're going to see in my valuation. They were a company that were, they were growing fast. They were aggressively reinvesting. You're saying, this is good. But here's the bad news. They were re so the reinvestment rate was 113%. They're putting everything, their earnings plus more into the company. But the return in capital they were earning in rupee terms then was 9.2%. Now, if this were a US company earning 9.2%, you're saying, that's a pretty good number. But this was an Indian company 12, 12 years ago earning 9.2% when the cost of capital in Indian rupees was 17%. We're seeing value destruction in action, right? Whenever a company earns less than its cost of capital, it's destroying value. 
And if corporate governance is good, what do you assume? They'll fix it. Over time, the return on capital move to the cost of capital, margins will improve. But this is a family controlled company. So in my first go around, I said, there is no chance that this company would change. And part of the reason is they weren't aware that this was a problem. Their reaction is, well, we're making money. And they are making money. They're just not making enough money to cover their cost of capital. So the way I value the company is I left the return on capital at 9.2% in perpetuity. This is a value destroying machine that never stops running. It doesn't make the value zero. The value that I got was 62 rupees, assuming that they never fix this problem. So if you truly believe that corporate governance is dead and you have a badly managed company, the way it's going to show up is they're going to earn less than the cost of capital or have low margins and nothing will be done to fix it. But let's say this family wakes up, you know how the family will, will, will recognize the problem, right? Their wealth is tied up in the company. The market will attach a low price. In fact, this, the market is actually treating them pretty well, 102 rupees, but they felt that they were being priced too low. So let's say they bring you in as a professional manager because they don't think the family can run the company and you're given charge of fixing this company. What's the first thing you're going to do the day you walk in? What's the first thing you're going to do? You could try to fix all their old projects, but that's going to take a lot of work. But so what's the minimum? You can stop taking bad projects, right? That's a minimal requirement here. I value the company assuming that that's all you did. So basically the old projects I assume are earning less than the cost of capital. There's nothing you can do about it, but on the new projects, you earn at least your cost of capital. I'm not asking for miracles. I'm not asking you, you to make yourself Apple or Google. You're not going to get there, but you earn the cost of capital. Remember the previous value was 62 rupees? Assuming they earn the cost of capital, the return on capital converges from the cost of capital, no, or moves at least towards it. Let's say you can't get all the way there. You can move it to 12%. The value per share goes to 84. In fact, if you can get new projects to earn the cost of capital, the value per share goes up to 110 or 120 rupees per share. And that might mean not reinvesting at all. You're saying, what if I can't find projects that earn the cost of capital? Very simply, stop reinvesting. That'll accomplish exactly the same as raising the return on capital to the cost of capital. So first step, stop taking bad projects. But once you've been there in a, for a while, maybe you can look at the old projects and see if you can bring them up to speed. If you can bring the old projects up to speed, you get a second. Remember the deficiency growth we talked about? You're still not all the way to the cost of capital, but the more you can move your returns on projects to the cost of capital, the higher the value per share will. So here's the way I would quantify the corporate governance discount. If I thought that there was no chance of change, corporate governance is dead, the value per share is 62 rupees and I'll stop there. If I thought that, the, that corporate governance has a chance, either because the family is receptive to this change or you can force them to make the change, the value per share is going to start to rise to 100 rupees, 100, depending on how much work needs to be done to fix those existing investments. So one thing that I do track in your, when you do, you do your valuation is your return on capital over time. Most of you, the marginal return on capital is well above the cost of capital. You're looking at companies where there's hope. But if you're looking at a company where your return on capital is less than the cost of capital and corporate governance in that company is weak, that's pretty much why you can get away using that low return on capital and ending up with a low value because change is not coming. Yes. Can you give that yeah, absolutely, right, basically. But to do the expected value, you have to actually have to quantify what change will look like. You see what I mean? Remember the Hormel, we did two valuations. You can't, it can't be diffused because the change is good. To be quite honest, do I want Elon Musk running Twitter? I don't think so. Why? Because for him, it might be a play toy. In which case, I'm going to get dragged down into the muck as he plays with Twitter. So that's, but if he is the catalyst, that lead, and that's what I think will happen for other investors saying, you know what, there must be a way to better monetize 
this huge social. I have never seen a company that's so much a center of, I mean, think of how many news stories we read that starts with a tweet in the middle, right? The New York Times, there's a, there's a tweet. This is in all our lives, but it's amazing how much difficulty they've had converting that degree of, of dominance in social media into making money. I don't, yeah. It's gone through, this is like the eighth time it's gone through this, right? And maybe it's just a platform. What's the, what, what's the attraction of Twitter? 250 characters. You, and it's tough to actually engage people and keep them. You're never going to get the Facebook type of engagement on Twitter where people or, or the people who hang out on Twitter for two hours are not mentally healthy people. So usually on Twitter, you come and you go. You, you're not going to stay engaged. So maybe it's a platform problem. They've created a platform that attracts people because of its brevity, but it's exactly the kind of quality that might make it difficult to monetize that platform. But I think we need to start thinking, what can Twitter do to actually monetize it? Maybe there's a pathway. And if we can find it, the value you can get would be much higher because with 350 million people on the platform right now, it's everywhere. You could argue it is where news breaks now. And everybody, in fact, I know New York Times reporters who check Twitter all the time to see what news is breaking rather than the other way around. Fourth, and again, this is not unique to emerging market companies, but might be exaggerated with emerging market companies. Because so many emerging market companies are parts of family groups you have this cross-holding issue. And as you know, in this quiz, cross-holdings are the nightmare part of valuation. What do you add? What do you subtract out? Minority interest, minority holdings. The residue of cross-holdings is just tough to deal with. But for many of these companies, you can't ignore it because big chunks of value in these companies come from their cross-holdings. So we know how to value cross-holdings. But in the, in the quiz, I gave you two cross-holdings one minority and one majority. Imagine having 75 or 90 cross holdings. Think of the mopping up you have to do. So I'm gonna give you an example of how cross holdings can take over your story. Don't write, try to read this slide. Basically it's a valuation of four companies in the Tata group. Tata Motors, Tata Steel, Tata Chemicals, and Tata Consulting Services. All part of the same family group. They're all individually publicly traded companies. But here's what I want to focus on. I value the companies, but I'm gonna show you what percentage of each company's value per share came from their cross holdings. See the blue part? That's free cash flow firm discounted the cost of capital. That's what we spent so much time talking about. The red part is the cross holding part. So if you look at Tata Chemicals, Stata Steel and Tata Motors, about half of their value comes not from the company, but from their cross holdings and other Tata companies. Tata Consulting Services, it's a sliver. Anybody know why, why is Tata, Tata, I mean, they're all part of the same family group. Why do you think Tata Consulting Services gets so much less of its value from cross holdings than the other Tata companies? Yes. But that could be said about all those companies, right? In a sense, why is TCS avoiding it? No. In fact, let's step back. What, how did Tata Chemicals, Tata Motors, and Tata Steel end up with such big portions of other Tata companies? It's not a conspiracy to get you, right? It feels like it when you're valuing these companies. But I think if you step back and go back 40 or 50 years, all of these companies were private, 100% owned by the Tata family. They were all part of the family group. So let's assume Tata Steel needed to build a new plant. And Tata Motors had a really good year. Remember, the family owns all of the, these companies. You know what the family would do? They would take money out of Tata Motors and put into Tata Steel, perfectly legal because you own all of the companies. And the accounting then would be that when Tata Motors money was invested in Tata Steel, Tata Motors was given a piece of Tata Steels to make the balance sheets balance. This is a residue of history. You're saying, why is TCS less exposed? Because it's the youngest of the Tata companies. 
and it was created after the other companies went public. So you don't have this residue of history show up. So if you get a chance, look at the Samsung group. You'll notice that the electronics subsidiaries have much smaller cross holdings than the old traditional Samsung companies because that's where the history kind of shows up. And finally, we talked about truncation risk. Truncation risk, as I said, is the risk that you will not make. We talked about it in the context of distressed companies. With emerging market companies, in addition to distress, you have all kinds of other truncation risks. Let's not be abstract. We're having spur bank now. You know what you worry about? That the Russian government might nationalize your equity. It's not like spur bank is going to be bankrupt and driven out because banks continue. But if the Russian government says no foreign equity investors will be considered as equity investors. There's not a whole lot you can do, right? What are you going to do? Sue in a Russian court and expect to get compensated? Truncation risk is a much bigger issue with emerging market companies, partly because of things like nationalization and partly because the legal structure protecting ownership is much weaker in many of these countries. Remember, your ownership stake in a company is only as good as the legal structure that protects it. So if you have a legal structure that doesn't protect it, it's like owning nothing. It's what should also terrify you about owning shares in Tencent and Alibaba, right? Because as long as the Chinese government says these variable interest entities in the Cayman Islands are okay, your equity is worth a lot. But if tomorrow they say that those, and that's why every time the Chinese government says anything about these variable interest entities, which is how Alibaba and Baidu are structured, their stock prices gyrate because there goes your value. So I'm going to use a company that you don't normally think of with truncation risk, but it's Aramco. Aramco, as you well know, is the Saudi Arabian oil company. It, it announced its IPO in 2019. I think they started talking about it in like 2012. It took them seven years. And we'll talk about what in the process of it. And it's actually a very easy company to back. Why? It's really 330 million barrels of oil under the set that you're buying. You're not buying a company, you're basically buying perhaps the cheapest oil reserves in the world. And here's how I valued it. I just said, look, and there are two ways you can value it. One is at the time that they announced their IPO, Aramco also announced that they were going to pay out 75% of their earnings as dividends at the minimum. Very few companies can make that guarantee. Aramco had the cash flows to do it. So the first valuation, I basically took their promised dividends and I estimated them for 50 years. Normally we don't do this, right? We stop at the end of year 10, we attach a terminal value. Here, the reason I did it is I knew how much oil there was under the ground. And basically I just extracted all the oil. And by the end of the 50th year, all you're left with is sand. You're saying, why isn't there a terminal value? How much would you pay for Saudi sand? not much. So there's no salvage value or terminal value. So basically I'm running the company into the ground. You take the present value of the dividends, the value that I got was $1.6 trillion. At the time Aramco went public, overnight, it had become the largest market cap company in the world. Because Apple then wasn't quite at one and a half trillion. So 1.6 trillion, why? Because it's 330 million barrels of oil. You're saying, but you're using dividends. Can they afford to pay these dividends? They can actually afford to pay more than 75% of their earnings as dividends. What reinvestment do you need? The reserves are already there. If you stick your finger in the sand, oil comes out of the ground. It's not like you have heavy capital expenditures. The free cash flow equity, if I, if I discounted that, the value that I got was about 1.6 billion. So either way, with a dividend discount model or by discounting cash flows in the next 50 years, I'm coming up with an overall value, 1.5, 1.6, 1.7 trillion. I almost stopped there, but if you're buying a Ramco, remember you're not buying a traditional company. In fact, I don't even know whether you're buying a company. I think you're buying a country. You see why? I think 75% of Saudi Arabia's GDP comes from oil. Aramco produces it all. So when you're buying Aramco, you're actually buying Saudi Arabia, Inc., a country. And then if you step back and saying, you're not even really buying a country, you're buying a piece of a ruling family, right? 
the House of Saud essentially runs, I don't know what they, I can say, own Saudi Arabia, but they view it as part of their, their heritage. You see where I'm going? As long as the House of Saud stands, this value is okay. I'm not making any political predictions, so don't, don't tweet out you know, that I'm expecting a, re a regime change. But if you're buying these cash flows in the next 50 years, you're making a bet that the House of Saud will continue to run Saudi Arabia for the next 50 years. And the, I think the probability is pretty high that they can pull it off, but it's definitely the probability that something bad will happen, that a regime change will happen is definitely not zero. So here's how I brought in regime change. You can't bring it into the cash flows. How the heck do you bring in expected effects of who's going to run the country? So I did what I did with the distressed company. I did my base case valuation as if there were no regime change. I came up with 1.65 billion, trillion, I'm sorry. And then I asked the question, what is the chance that you would have the equivalent of what happened in Egypt 12 years ago? But remember, you know, you overnight went from a dictator for life to a new government coming in. And over a 50 year period, that's going to mount up. 20% chance over 50 years is basically like a 0.5% chance a year. And I made an assumption. I said, even if a new government comes in, that's much more, no, it, it's much less friendly to investors. They're not going to nationalize the company because well, they still need external capital to keep going. But they might increase the royalties. Remember the way one of your costs as Aramco is the royalty you have to pay to the government. Right now, 80% of the Saudi budget comes from Aramco dividends, Aramco earnings, Aramco cash flows, and Aramco royalty. So the government can say, look, you know, you, you are still shareholders, but we're going to double how much it's going to cost you in terms of royalties when you extract oil. Out. This has happened in other countries, Venezuela, for instance. I think tripled the cost of what, what oil companies had to pay to get oil out. What's that going to do? It's going to make the company less profitable. And I made a judgment call. I said, you know, if that happens, my value could very well be halved and you can estimate how much it will be for different royalty amounts. And I took the expected value. It's, it's a back of the envelope adjustment. But you're saying there's a lot of estimates here, you know, you, you may, if you, if you ignore it completely, are you making an estimate? Absolutely. You're making an estimate that this property is zero, nothing will happen. I think any estimate is better than that. Now, of course, you want to spend the money and bring Saudi experts in and make that probability judgment a little better. All the more power to you, but I think this is something you need to think about whenever you have a company. We have a significant risk that something can happen that changes your ownership structure. As you know, the Russian stock started trading, I think, a week and a half ago, it's kind of very lightly. But this is now, I mean, about two or three weeks from now, you're going to see the London Stock Exchange open trading on some of the Russian stocks, at least to give investors a chance to get out. They can't leave them shut down forever. And if you're inclined to buy Russian companies and you get over your, your concerns about the morality of it, and you say that I'm going to do it, then the only way to assess what Spurbank or Severstall or Yandex is worth is to bring in this risk of what will happen to my equity if the Russian government decides that foreign investors can't hold shares. And that property is definitely not zero. Any questions? Let's talk about valuing banks. I'll make a confession. Until 2008, I used to start this section about valuing banks with the words, valuing banks is easy. I've never been able to live that down. But I'll, I'll tell you why I used to make those statements. I made two assumptions about banks that led me to that conclusion. First, I assumed that banks were run by sensible people. And second, I assumed that the regulatory authorities actually are doing their jobs. And you know why this helped me, right? Essentially, because regulatory authorities are doing the jobs, I don't have to worry about the riskiness of banks because the regulators are going to make sure that banks are not doing something insanely stupid. And because banks are run by sensible people, they pay out only what they can afford to, right? You see where this led me? If you assume that banks are run by sensible people and that the regulatory overlay works, 
you can cheat and say, I'm going to take the dividends that banks pay, assume that that is in fact a fair estimate of the free cash flow equity and just discount them. You're saying, why not just compute the free cash flow equity? Think of how we compute free cash flow equity. We start with earnings. We subtract out net capex. I want you to think about what capex for a bank is and depreciation is for a bank. Then you subtract out change in working capital. Again, I want you to think about what are current assets and current liabilities for a bank. And you very quickly see why through time, whenever people have tried to estimate cash flows for banks, they throw up their hands and say, I can't do it. So the, the long story here is this is the sector where the dividend discount model continued way after it was abandoned every other sector. Because we think about asking the question, what are your cash flows from existing assets? I have no idea. I can see what your net income is. When I ask you what's the value of growth, if I don't know what your reinvestment is and what you're actually investing, how the heck do I judge your investments? How risky are you? I don't know, the loans you made, you tell me they're good. The regulatory authorities must be keeping an eye on you. I can't lever and unlever betas because I don't know what your debt is. Every question, you basically run this before. The way I describe this is banks are incredibly opaque. And because they're opaque, we trusted the dividend discount model to work for us. So this is actually a valuation of an Egyptian bank called CIB. It's actually a fairly well-run Egyptian bank. I valued in Egyptian dollars because I wanted to value the local currency. So it's a dividend discount model. It's a very simple dividend discount model. How does the dividend discount model work? You project out earnings and a payout ratio. So instead of having a reinvestment rate, it's earnings times payout is dividends. And when you think about growth, I use that very simplistic way of estimating growth of you tell me how much your retention ratio is, which is one minus the payout ratio. And so I'm staying with numbers I can estimate for a bank. So I'm not trying net capex change in working capital. I'm letting dividends drive the process. The one thing though with the dividend discount model is do the things you do with the regular valuation model, which is as growth comes down, your retention ratio should go up. So basically, I'm sorry, your retention ratio should come down. You should be able to pay out more of your earnings. So don't just take last year's dividends and, and work with them because it could change. In fact, you can use a dividend discount model to value a non-dividend paying bank. Sounds absurd, right? But if you have a high growth bank that right now is not paying dividends, here's how you use the dividend discount model you project growth up. So right now you're 20% growth, 0% payout ratio. But as that growth goes from 20 to 10 to five to two, your payout ratio will go up. By how much? Based on your return on equity, you can actually estimate what your payout ratio has to be. So you can actually use a dividend discount model. It's, it's more flexible than people realize it is, but you're trusting the dividends to be what the company can pay out. So the traditional dividend discount model value here basically is the present value of dividends at the cost of equity. The value that you get is 42 pounds, and that's actually higher than the stock price. There was nothing actually I could do with this. I can't actually trade from outside Egypt. But within Egypt, presumably, you could buy the stock and expect it to go up. You can use the dividend discount model to value any bank anywhere in the world that is paying dividends. And even if it's not paying dividends, by using estimated dividends. Why do we do it? Because banks are opaque. It's tough to know what's going on behind the surface. In fact, if you pick up an annual report for any non-financial company, an annual report for a money center bank, the money center bank can actually have hundreds and hundreds of pages. It's amazing how little they tell you in those hundreds of pages. Insanely opaque, and because it's opaque, you're giving up. It's desperation that's driving you to dividends because you say, I can't estimate cash flow. Now, incidentally, it's not just commercial banks. The same thing's true for investment banks. I have a valuation of, 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 of Goldman Sachs on my, which I, where I do the same thing. Pre-2008, I did everything based on dividends. So this was actually just after the crisis hit. Remember for Wells Fargo, I'd estimated a growth rate before the crisis and after the crisis. I still stayed with the dividend discount model because I did not know what else I could use. I was lost. In fact, I wrote a series of papers after 2000, the 2008 crisis, which I, where I you know, were asked a series of questions. What if, there's, what if nothing is risk-free? 
What if nothing is liquid? Basically, all those nightmare scenarios, we kind of avoid in valuation. And the context I looked at banks and what, how do we value banks? Because all we're stuck with is the dividend discount model. And while it is flexible, it's not flexible enough to deal with major disruption. The dividend discount model works with the relatively mature companies, but there's nothing big happening under the surface. And 2008 was something big. So this was my Wells Fargo valuation with my attempt to use the dividend discount model to capture the fact that regulatory capital needs had gone up. So I pushed up the regulatory capital, pushed down the return on equity. But even as I was doing this, I realized it wasn't enough. So I'm going to give you what I think is the opening you can use to value banks. When you value a traditional non-financial service company, the book value of equity is completely irrelevant. I don't know how, well, for how many of your companies this is true, but the book value of equity for a company can become negative. It freaks out accountants, but from my perspective, I say I don't care. Especially with young companies, who cares what the book value of equity is? But for banks, the book value of equity actually means something more. And here's why. Banks are regulated. In fact, there are these Accords called the Basel Accords, which are not, I don't know when they were put together, but they list out the regulatory capital requirements for banks. And they have different definitions, tier one, tier two, tier three. If you truly want to have a mind numbing exercise, pick up those banking things and try to read them. I, I have no idea what some of the stuff does, but here's the basis for all of the measures of regulatory capital. It starts with book equity and adjust from it. So the difference between tier one, tier two, and tier three is what I allow you to add to book equity. In some cases, I might allow you to add preferred stock. In other cases, some portions of convertible debt. But basically, they're all built on book equity. Do you see where I'm going? When a regular company goes and does a, buy, does a buyback, your book equity drops. You say, I don't care. When a bank does a buyback, its book equity drops, it could get into regulatory capital danger. Since 2008, actually, US banks, especially the ones that were helped out by the government in 2008, are required to get the Fed's approval for dividends and, big, and buybacks. Why? Because every time you pay dividends and you buy back stock, you're affecting your book equity, which is regulatory capital. The Fed says, because that is our basis for making sure you're safe, you got to get our approval. So I've thought about how can I replace this dividend discount model? Because dividends are not allowing me to capture the fact that banks can get into serious trouble where the dividends don't just go to zero, but they actually, the bank has to go out and raise fresh equity to stay afloat. So here's how I redefined reinvestment. For a bank to survive, it's got to meet the regulatory capital requirement. Right? So if, it's, if, if they say regulatory capital has to be 12% of loans, if you want to grow your loans, you've got to increase your regulatory capital. Moreover, if there's a shock to your regulatory capital because you lost $2 billion or a trader in Paris you know, managed to lose $5 billion for you, that comes out of regulatory capital, you've got to raise capital. So any time I think of reinvestment for a bank, I think about reinvestment into regulatory capital, either to grow or to just survive. Once I opened that door, my free cash flow equity came right out of that door. I said, to get the free cash flow equity for a bank, I'm going to start with net income because it's an equity income. And I'm going to subtract out how much this bank will have to reinvest in regulatory capital. So help me out here. If I'm adding a high growth bank, I'll have to reinvest more. Why? Because if I have to grow, I have to re get my regulatory capital. If I am valuing an undercapitalized bank, you know what I mean by an undercapitalized bank? There's a regulatory capital need, this bank has fallen. That bank will have to have more reinvestment to get back to steady state than an overcapitalized bank. I now have a lever to separate high growth from low growth banks, undercapitalized from overcapitalized banks through the free cap that, that investment in regulatory capital. The downside though, is you do have to get at least some understanding of regulatory capital. So I did the bare minimum. I, I am not an expert. I'm not even close to being knowledgeable on regulatory capital, but I know just enough to be dangerous. So I'm going to take what I learned and apply it to value. A bank you've all heard of. This is a bank that reminds me of, uh, you know how, how every Halloween Jason comes back and he kills a lot of people. 
It's a bank that reminds me of a horror story. Because especially since 2008, Deutsche she keeps going. It's like that teenager who keeps going down into the basement. We in every horror movie that you watch, there's this door and it's dark down there. The teenager goes and opens the door, looks down the stairs and you're saying, don't go down there. But every single horror movie, they go down and bad things happen. Usually they hear the sound of chainsaws in the basement, but they still want to go down and say, what is that sound down there? Deutsche Bank is like that teenager. So this was an evaluation I did of Deutsche in October of 2016. I'll send you the entire blog post. The title of the post was a Greek tragedy at a German bank. I, use, I chose my words deliberately. You know, I picked those words, right? German, the Germans always like to look at the Greeks and point out how undisciplined they are and how badly they run things. And here you have the ultimate German institution, Deutsche Bank, behaving like they accuse the Greeks of behaving. So I'll, I'll give you the backstory. October of 2016, Deutsche was in serious trouble. It had been assessed a $15 billion fine by the US Justice Department for something they did in 2008. I don't even remember what. Overnight, they had a regulatory capital problem. Why? Because if you pay out a $15 billion fine, guess where it comes from? It comes out of your book equity. Book equity dropped, their regulatory, their tier one capital ratio dropped to 12.41%. Now, part of this process is also gaining perspective. You're saying, is that low? Is that high? I looked at the regulatory capital ratios of big banks, and they were now in the bottom 20% 20% of banks. They were undercapitalized, and people were worried. They were losing tons of money. And if they kept losing money, every year you lose money, that, that hole is getting deeper. So there was actually talk in October of 2016 that the German government might have to step in and take the bank into receivership. It happened at the Royal Bank of Scotland after 2008 because they were in so much trouble. It's not like they're being nationalized, but the government takes them over because you can't exactly allow Deutsche Bank to go bankrupt because that's going to create runs all over, not just Germany, but over the rest of the world. So that's, that's worrying me that that could happen. But I put my optimist hat on. And I said, let me dig Deutsche out of this hole. So here's how I did. I assumed over time their return on equity, which was minus 13.7% in the year leading into my valuation, would improve to 9.44%. That looks awfully precise. But basically, over time, I'm improving their return on equity to be equal to their cost of equity. I'm saying, look, I don't want miracles, but at least get to a point where you can earn your cost of equity. As the return on equity goes from minus 13.7 to 9.44, the losses become profits. Please, magically, I've fixed the bank to make it profit. But for this to happen, they've got to fix a regulatory capital problem, right? So to do that, I set a target. I set the target at the 75th percentile because money center banks have these investment banking and riskier arms. So their, their regulatory capital will tend to be higher. And I said, over time, the regulatory capital ratios go from 12.41 to 15.67. You think, why do you need that? That allows me to estimate how much they will need to reinvest in regulatory capital. And in year one, they will need a huge reinvestment because they're really deep in the hole now with that 15 billion. So they need to have 6.6 .6 billion in year one. That then becomes my reinvestment each year. You take your net income or loss, subtract out the reinvestment, I get a free cash flow equity. Now, do you see why this is a horror story? Even with my optimist hat on, what am I saying about Deutsche? Next year, they will need to issue $11.7 .7 billion in equity to keep going. The year after, another 3.7. So I'm being realistic that this is going to take a lot of pain, a lot of new equity issuances. I'm negative free cash flows equity. Eventually, the free cash flows equity turned positive. But see how much more freedom you get than in a dividend discount model. In a dividend discount model, the worst thing I can do to, to Deutsche is have zero dividends for the first three years. But this is a much worse scenario for me as an equity investor because I have to go out and issue fresh shares. With that built in, the value per share that I got was about $23, $23 per share. That's assuming that they fix their profitability problem, that they get their regulatory cap up to wherever I need them to. But remember, I'm worried that this might not happen. They're one shock away, one big trading scandal away 
from essentially being pushed into the German government's receivership act. I tested 10% probability, and you're saying, why is it so low for such a damaged bank? It's because they're too big to fail. And, and I'm not using that as a, as, a, as a slogan, but it's true, right? Because if you think about bringing Deutsche in and trying to fix all the tentacles, nobody wants Deutsche to fail because it'll have effects on every other commercial bank and investment bank. So guess what? They're going to have a lot of help to kind of stay independent. If this had been a smaller bank with Deutsche's numbers, I'd have attached a 40% or a 50% chance because what the, what the government would then do is make a bigger bank take them over. That often happens with troubled banks. The equity will get wiped out, but the other bank will now, Deutsche is too big for that to happen. But there's a 10% chance that my equity could get wiped out. My expected value reflects that risk. It's again the truncation risk I'm bringing in, but I'm bringing it in not through my cash flows, but there is a number on the outside. One final point, and then we'll end for the day. You know, when you look at financial service firms out there, not every financial service firm is a banker and investment bank. You now have PayPal, you've got Paytm. I mean, you've got companies all over the world, and many of them are not, not making loans. They make money off transactions. So I'm going to close with a valuation I did of a company called Paytm. It's an Indian Oh, no, it's, it, it's had a very checkered history since it went public, but it's on it's, its basic selling point is that 330 million Indians are on its platform. What can you use it for? It's like you can use it like Venmo to transfer money, you can use it to pay for things. But in these companies, the one common theme is you start with what their gross, much the, the value of the transactions that go through their platforms. It's like, I mean, think of Visa, MasterCard, right? Think of the transactions you can go through. These companies get a small slice of those transactions. It's called a take rate. So Visa, for instance, that take rate is like two and a half to three percent. American Express is like three and a half percent. For Paytm, that number was 0.79 percent. The problem has the, the company has a business problem. In this valuation, what I projected out was what would happen to the gross merchandising value going through the platform and what the take rate. For those of you valuing PayPal or companies like that, that's a good strategy to adopt because it separates the two. Because there are two ways you can increase revenues. One is by having more value go through your platform. And the second is by having a higher take rate. And it allows you to model those out and value what you get as the bottom line. But whenever you're valuing companies like these, kind of look at where the value is coming from, where are revenues, because Revenues for a financial service firm are really messy. What is Zillow's revenues? I don't even know what Zillow reports as revenues. So it's actually, you have to get that nailed down before you start value. That's about it. I will see you on Wednesday. Please print off packet two when you get a chance because we're getting very close to the end of packet one. So next session will probably start in packet two. So make sure you print it off or download it or whatever you need to do. Yes. Hi. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so I finally got my choice, but I see that in Albert, my neighbors are still the same in this spot. What did I, what were you, what were your reasons? Uh, because I entered this grade. Did I make it? Did I not make the change? What is it showing up as? Shows up at six and a half. Not, yeah. Okay, just send me an email. Okay, thank yeah. you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Could you uh, send for everybody like a model of uh, score A valuation so we can see uh, how we of can what valuation? I'm sorry. Like uh, test valuation for any students that you think that is really good or. Oh, what? Oh, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, what, I'm kind of lost of what you expect us to deliver. In the end of the project, like only the spreadsheet, the spreadsheet plus the story. Um, but the examples of past projects online. Mm -hmm. Go look online. You'll have, you'll see examples of past projects. Oh, online. So we check. also have it in the website. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. like the so check and, it. Oh, okay. So check it on my website, not on the Brightspace, but on what my website, oh, the okay. web page. You should be able to see past projects. Oh, okay. Thank yeah? you so much.